good evening in a socially distanced world design united is an optimistic platform digital platform for collaborative design and connection welcome to design united's fifth design conversation with Kalpa World and Compartment S4. I am Varna Shashidar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by Claywork Spaces and our Design United team in this endeavor. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young designers and design practices, much needed during these uncertain times. The selected design studios have a deep resonance with the place they are from. Design Conversation is one such attempt by Design United. We have had in the past wonderful young designers and moderators from the region who have joined us in our previous past four conversations. Bogar Studio and Studio Meet, Anai Studio, Be Polite from India, Kavan Balasuria from Sri Lanka, and Studio Neba from Nepal. Our next set of conversations too have talented young design practices joining us from the region, from Bali, from Pune, from Mumbai and Singapore to share the design approaches and journey. So please join us every week. With this background to Design United, let's move to the much anticipated conversation today. It's indeed a delight to welcome our presenting designers for the evening, Rabi Malla of Kolpa World Nepal and Krishna Nishita Manik Vedanti Aman Kishan Manuni Prasik, the eight architects and friends who formed Compartment S4 Ahmedabad, India. We start our presentation today by traveling to Nepal with designer Rabi Malla, who joins us with his presentation, Design for Social Change. So to introduce Rabi, Rabi Malla started Kolpa World in 2014, initially making cotton tote bags with two indigenous communities in Nepal and gradually expanded through his work with eight indigenous communities in different parts of Nepal, including the Tharu community from Southern Nepal and the Rote community, who are also the last hunter gatherers of Nepal. Kolpa World and Rabi work with different locally sourced materials, designing and creating products with wild nettle, hemp, cardamom, straw to create fresh design, both for home accessories and crafts through fair trade and fair pricing. We're, we're delighted to have Kolpa World with us and Ravi, who will be our first speaker for today. Our second presentation today will be by Compartment S4. Compartment S4 is a collaborative of eight friends who graduated from the architecture program of SEPT University Ahmedabad in 2017. Compartment S4 is a multidisciplinary practice that seeks to provide design solutions in both formal and informal sectors of urban and rural India. They have been looking at a range of initiatives from governmental and private projects 
publications, furniture design, construction workshops, and curating design events. I think there is a small change in program. We will be starting with compartment S4 and ending the presentation with um, Kolpa World. Welcome compartment S4. We really look forward to your presentation today. Hello, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much, uh, Design uh, United, Vanna, to, uh, for having us here. And it, it's, uh, it's lovely to present uh, our work uh, to, to, to a different set of audience this time. Um, so just, just give me one minute. Yeah. So. Uh, so compartment S4, uh, we are a bunch of eight uh, friends who we graduated from SEPT University in 2017. This photograph is from our university and uh, it's, it's where we sort of initiated, like it's, it's essentially where we learned about architecture and our, our, so our ideologies were formed over there. Yes, uh, why, after soon, like uh, while we were still in our thesis, we sort of uh, started collecting our ideas and we all had a similar uh, inclination towards working for the rural uh, and or the more informal sector uh, and providing design and architecture services in the informal sector. And with these ideologies, we f uh, formalized compartment as well. So, compartment S4 is a uh, practice, as I said, it's by eight architects. These are, these are the eight of us. Uh, most of us are here today and uh, I, I, I'd like to introduce all of them. So, Krishna Parit, Monik Shah, Vedanti Agarwal, uh, Kishan, Kishan Shah, Manani Patel, Prasik Chaudhary and Mishida Parmar and I'm Aman. And we're all, most of us are here and we'll, we'll be glad to take questions after uh, this presentation as well. So compartment S4, it's been three years now and uh, we've been, uh, we've sort of diversified ourselves into different, different sorts of uh, mini practices are one, in, under one practice and we've been doing a lot of different kinds of work. So which includes a lot of workshops, uh, government projects, rural in interventions, developer driven projects in urban areas, interior design, private architecture and simultaneously we're all so uh, very interested in research and publication and uh, we're sort of uh, right now also experimenting on building products and furniture so in the while while uh, in the last three years we've sort of developed it developed a brand which is which looks uh, uh, into a much wider spectrum and not just a purely architectural practice but we're sort of trying to uh, build a more widespread solution driven practice So right now, uh, one of the main, uh, uh, apart from uh, the architecture projects, we, we do uh, workshops, publications, and documentations. Workshops have uh, handmade workshops. Handmade workshops, uh, some of you might know them, are basically uh, construction workshops which we conduct in uh, biannually uh, in rural areas of India. And we... We, uh, the idea is to uh, understand the issues and uh, the current vernacular system existing in these in these rural areas, and so we sort of build upon them and make a building by our own hands. And uh, th this this is something that we've been doing every summer and every winter, and uh, every summer most of the time uh, in in uh, in Uttarakhand and every winter in uh, in in Gujarat. 
uh fnc friday night conversations uh, is something that feeds uh, a lot of uh, our more academic uh, uh, side of the practice where we uh, very similar to this platform we we invite a lot of architects and uh, it's uh, 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 people, uh, practitioners from allied fields to come and present their work and it's it's more of a platform where a lot of young architects and young designers come and uh discuss their ongoings and it sort of it's it becomes it's now a platform where an exchange of ideas uh, can can happen and a larger discourse can be formed out of fnc we've so, uh, recently started a new platform called unmute which is our first self published uh, magazine uh unmute is uh, a platform where uh based on the kind of topics that we discuss in fnc we we started uh, uh, inviting writers and artists and designers to give in uh give give in their uh, entries and we we sort of curate it and we uh, we publish them so the first two editions of unmute just came out last week and these are the first two ones the uh, the first one is called uh, housing housing integrity is narratives and the second one is housing integrities ideas so both of them are currently uh, due to the uh, state of the affair right now so we, uh, they're not in print uh, right now but both of them are currently available on issue and you, if you if anybody wants a pdf you can just mail it mail us and we'll send you a pdf as well uh, we we're also planning to soon uh, hopefully by next month come out with another Uh, another uh, topic uh, for unmute and if anybody of you is interested in writing for us please please do get in touch and i'll i'll hand it over to vedanti from here um, and she will take it forward thanks aman uh, so i'll just be taking out of the many initiatives that aman introduced i'll be taking you through our rural projects in uttarakhand um Uh, so this if you just see the map of uttarakhand we have been mainly working in nainital around nainital haridwar and uh, the pori district which comes close up north further up north um this was the first project that we did near nainital it's in a village called gogukham and uh, our approach to most of our rural projects start with a research of the context the people and the material followed by um, a kind of back and forth design between the local sarpanch or the local bodies and our users and then eventually a design execution of design in, in the form of a handmade workshop so this project was was an extension for the government school and it was done along with the uh, funding of local sarpanch and a private donor uh, we we were trying to solve issues of earthquake resilient uh, resilience in the area as well as prime, uh, providing a solution for uh, leakage in the roof which was uh, due to the current due to the vernacular um, method of laying slate this is how the project came about and uh, it's currently in use following this project we submitted an entry for a competition Uh, for the build academy hosted by the build academy and uh, world bank it was again a competition for earthquake resilient housing and uh, we proposed uh, we proposed certain aspects of sustainability as well as resilience uh, within our design we were trying to use the local material which is stone and wood uh, but uh, integrating certain structural and technical Uh, aspects of design which could make the design resilient so uh, we were using gabion uh, gabion st stone wall construction as a, a construction technique along with the wooden portal frame so that the two act as separate independent structures in case of an earthquake we had also tried to um, integrated aspects of uh, thermal comfort as well as water storage and uh, expandability of the house uh, for future needs within the design this is uh, how it looked like so if you see the bottom is a gabion wall structure while the top is a timber portal frame and they both support each other that was the that this is the design entry eventually we took this design entry to the uttarakhand government uh, in pori district 
and uh, it was built. So uh, we presented it to them as a housing project, but then the government took it forward uh, as a tourism center. This uh, project was went through a couple of iterations um, along with the district office as well as the local uh, government bodies in Pali, uh, in Khirsu village. So this was executed in Khirsu village. Uh, it initially started by trying to activate a group of local leaders uh, who, were, who came together to manage this as a tourism center. So the program evolved to include um, a community kitchen, a tourism display center, uh, sorry, a tourism display space, uh, uh, an accommodation for tourists, as well as a food network, um, a food processing and packaging network for the local produce of the area. Uh, this was the construction. Uh, these are some of the construction photos. Again, the construction took place in two parts. So we initially had certain uh, amount of training that we were conducting for local masons. We did a mud plaster training workshop for um, locals. And then there was um, a, a workshop that we conducted for students. So it was for about 10, 20 to 25 students, a 15 day workshop where we were trying to build um, the JBN walls below. After the workshop, we then went on to make the timber structure, which is on top. During the workshop, we were also documenting the village. So we uh, were documenting the local traditions, craft, uh, the local produce, um, the kind of house forms. And all of this, all of this documentation was eventually um, like was eventually put down in the form of an exhibition as exhibition panels and was presented in the exhibition space of the building. So this, this the second workshop that we took in the area was on um, documenting the space. So the first was a construction workshop, second was a documentation workshop. Here we had different kinds of um, participants. We had exhibition designers, conservationists, um, as well as uh, visual artists who collaborated with us for the workshop. So these were some of the panels that we designed for the workshop uh, as a product of the workshop. There was, we had documented the wildlife of Kirsu, uh, the map, the overall map of the village and the kind of um, public spaces or amenities that were available around the village. Also, we found that the women formed a very integral part of the community because they were the hard workers. They, they used to be, um, they, they were mainly involved in all of the housework as well as a certain amount of um, sewing and stitching, which could get remuneration for the house. Uh, so this, that is why we decided to, to uh, make women as the local leaders of, of this project. And uh, they eventually went on to manage uh, the tourism center. This is how it looks now after the execution. The bottom is the community kitchen. The top is uh, the exhibition space, while the building beside it on the left-hand side is the accommodation. So this is how it functions. Uh, the, uh, uh, as a process of uh, working through the project, we named this community space, community tourism uh, network as uh, BASA. BASA means a one night stay in uh, the local language. So BASA is now a center and it is envisioned to become a network for further homestays to develop in Khirsu village so that it can promote community tourism as uh, for to support ecology and not the kind of tourism that has been uh, taking place in the religious networks of the area. This is the community kitchen and uh, those are the women who who now run the space. This is the exhibition uh, space and the panels that were displayed around all around. Uh, this can also be used as a, this was also imagined to be used as a multi-purpose space for the guests who would come and stay uh, in the accommodation. That's the group of women who now run the space. Uh, this was the day of inauguration. So it, it was a huge event where um, we had the, um, the Uttarakhand minister who was on board and a large number of uh, villagers, not only in Khirsu, but also around uh, the area. 
so now this uh, the basa has been set up as a model for this district and it can now be replicated all around we are hoping that this becomes uh, an entry point for us to also take forward this idea of eco tourism and empowering a community to uh, take ownership of their local resources adding value to what already exists so this is one of the projects that we did in in uh, just like this we have executed a number of other projects not only in uttarakhand but also in gujarat and uh, close to gujarat and maharashtra so uh, all of these projects we generally document them in the form of uh, books and uh, it's a documentation of the material uh, the kind of materials we are using the different approaches to participatory design that we generally experiment and implement um, all of this is available as open source on our website and uh, it's open for all students and other professionals to learn from or even uh, add to yeah that's about it uh, that's us and So should, uh, I think I'm done there. Okay. okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Compartment S4, for, for a fantastic presentation. Very, very interesting work. Um, we will now move on, move on to the second uh, presenter for the day. Uh, we are open to taking questions. Uh, kindly type in your questions. There will this sec uh, the second presentation will be followed by a conversation um, session where your questions will be answered. The second presenter for the day is uh, from Kolpa World, Rab uh, designer Rabi Malla. Welcome, uh, Rabi Malla. Hello. We... Hi. Hi. We look forward to your presentation. Okay. Uh, so I hope everybody can hear me. Let me just share my screen. Yes. Okay, namaste. Uh, I'm Ravi Malla from Kolpa. I am the founder of this um, social business and uh, hope everyone is safe and sound um, in this COVID-19 pandemic. I wish everyone be safe. And uh, yeah, um, I'll be talking about uh, design and its impact on society. And uh, I'm gonna talk about some uh, two different approaches that we have taken when we are um, uh, dealing with our different communities here in Nepal. And uh, let me tell you, some, give you my brief instructions about me and Kolpa. Well, uh, as Varna already, uh, uh, moderator already uh, uh, detail out uh, who am I and how Kolpa has started. Uh, well, yeah, it, did, it was started in 2003. The sex, but it remained dormant for another eight years as I was uh, abroad for my um, for the studies, uh, doing my uh, masters. And only after 2014, I took uh, um, you know after a few years of research on communities and materials and products they were making, uh, it took a bit of pace. And since then, um, yeah, we haven't looked back. So let me move on to my uh, uh, presentations. Um, uh, as you know, Nepal is a small country um, in the area, and, uh, but it, it is quite rich in natural resources. Um, as you see in the map, geographically, it is quite diverse. Um, you will find the range of highest mountains, a uh, two-plain field on the, in the south. In the hot and humid weather was the south, you will find a lot of great valleys and hills. And so this is, uh, though it's small, it's, it's quite diverse. So uh, with, the, with the diverse of these uh, reasons comes the diversity in people and their skills to cope with the climatic conditions of that reason. And so for here, you can see uh, to your left, uh, there's a woman, uh, she's from Dolpa. And uh, Dolpa is, um, it's quite a mountainous reason. And uh, we call Dolpa reason as a, uh, land beyond Himalayas, 
So usually it takes like almost like seven days of trek from the nearest accessible uh, bus station to get to this place uh, where we are uh, working with one of the Tolpo communities. And here she's working uh, um, on a blanket uh, with uh, made from a yak wool. And here in the, uh, there's another uh, reason uh, in the mid hills where there's abundant of forest and greeneries and there's like so much of plant resources there. And here a man uh, from, from Calicut is weaving a, 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 a nettle rock out of organic uh, wild nettle. And when you go to the, uh, to, towards the south of Nepal, uh, you will see uh, um, Tharu women. Um, and, and these women are making, uh, makes like, um, um, you know, traditional baskets and, and, uh, and uh, mats for themselves. Here are ladies weaving a floor mats from, um, um, from a grass, wetland grass that grows on the banks of the river. You see there's a lot of diversity in, in skills from the northern Himalayas towards the southern plain. And uh, <clears throat> so a community from, uh, from one region may not have skills, uh, the same skills um, with the uh, uh, community from another region. So it is very unique. And so these are the, um, the locations um, that the Kolba is working with. And the one in the green circles are the one uh, uh, that we are involved in. It's quite diverse. You know, we, it's been like 78 years that um, we started uh, uh, this Kolba thing. And uh, uh, yeah, we have collected quite a lot of communities. Uh, uh, like every region, we haven't uh, been able to cover like many communities at, uh, from one reason all at once, but like, you know, there are pocket of communities that we're working with. So it, it ranges from, uh, from the east towards the south, from the north to, um, uh, towards the south, yes. From uh, east to west to north to south. So let me just explain to you about uh, the materials um, that we are working with. Uh, these are some of the materials we are working with. All of them are natural, and some are plant-based and some are animal-based. Um, you know, in plant-based materials like Himalayan wild nettle, there is hemp, and uh, there is highland cane. And this is also something called a camel's foot climber that grows in the forest. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, most of these materials uh, um, are grows in the area where... Uh, you know, we have a community forest um, here. And so uh, every time to, uh, when we need to harvest these materials, our partners has to take a permission from the government. And so in pictures, you will see the woman with the um, Himalayan wild nettle bark here. Uh, she's working on a, on a breaking of this fiber. And there's another one is uh, called, from the Southern Plain, it's called Taifa. And uh, not only the plant-based materials, we're also uh, working with the animal-based materials, like uh, especially on the northern part of Nepal, where there are lots of mountain sheep, yak, yaks, and uh, goats. Uh, they make um, uh, nice uh, rocks out of uh, goat here, and also mountain sea pools. And uh, you know, even uh, Nepal has, uh, uh, you know, Nepal Nepalese have been making their uh, traditional handmade leather goods uh, um, uh, from the um, from the animal hide without using any uh, modern equipments. So it's a, it's a traditional leather, and so here is the uh, uh, there are you know, uh, you know there are so many communities that we are involved in, but the more uh, there are two approaches that we uh, take when we are uh, working with them, and uh, first approach is like it's very common, and uh, we have a, we have done this with many other uh, com uh, communities. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about is Karu community from the southern plain from Nawal Parashi, and. Uh, um, and the Tharu communities, uh, um, you know, they always uh, they follow the conventional design tools and techniques. And uh, you know, design uh, uh, conventional means that that you have, uh, um, you know, you you come up with, uh, you go to, uh, go and do some research on on the materials uh, uh, that's locally found and the skills of the communities uh, that they have, and you. Uh, uh, Come up with an idea of making products out of it. You you work together with them. You brainstorm, and then you develop a prototype. And then after a few trials and error, you come up with a finished product. And you know, with, when going through these uh, uh, um, uh, techniques, and and after a few um, after a, uh, uh, you know going through the product development and marketing, uh, they will that community will 
see a tangible uh, change in it. You will see a monetary progress in it. So, and the second approach is, uh, uh, it's a quite a bit of uh, send, uh, you, uh, you know, that approach is something that we are very cautious about. And because uh, 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 these people are a little bit more, um, uh, it's, um, uh, quite um, uh, quite a fixed one. They do not, um, you know, they don't care about the, uh, the uh, everyday product. Uh, only thing they care about is the tradition and their culture. So uh, keeping that in mind, uh, um, you know, uh, and the, we, we have a very different approach to them. And for them, it's not about the uh, money uh, or, or anything about being prosperous. That's uh, for them, it's more about their uh, support to their culture and traditions. So that's what, what we call the intangible growth and tangible change. And we have been able to get that. Uh, and the, here is the, um, uh, the uh, Taru community that we have worked with uh, that I just showed you uh, um, and, and, and told you about that where we, uh, um, we have approached with the first, uh, um, you know, uh, first approach where they follow design tools and, and techniques. And, uh, you know, in this, uh, uh, with this kind of community, what we do is first we identify the, uh, the raw materials and skills that they have here with the Tharu community from Southern Plain of Non Parashi. We identify the Taifa, or uh, that's an English name, but this grass the lady is holding, and what we call as a potier in local language. And uh, uh, we identify that as a, a, a raw materials, and which is evidently found in the banks of the river uh, in that part of Nepal. And so, and, uh, and it also, um, you know, they have been using this grass for uh, quite a long time. And once we know it, like they have been using this for generations. And also if we don't, if they don't use it, it will just uh, uh, decompose and it will just, you know, uh, be worthless. So, um, but the way they have used those uh, materials in, in making floor mats like this was simply beautiful. And, and finding the uh, aesthetic value of this grass you know, we, we work with these uh, communities and uh, thought of making some different product. And so in this la um, last uh, five years, we have been able to uh, make a very nice product out of that grass and using those local skills, like these uh, setting stools, and they are beautifully done and quite durable as well. And from the paint floor mats, now we have been able to uh, develop this, uh, develop and make this kind of uh, baskets, which is quite in demand. So, and, uh, and also it's, it looks more pleasing and it's more, uh, it has more aesthetic value. And uh, so, uh, so this is how we um, deal with the, with the people uh, uh, using our first approach. And uh, they see a kind of tangible growth in there. Uh, the amount of grass needed to weave a single floor mat of four feet by six feet will be enough to weave like 12 baskets, the one you have seen on your right. And so it means like they almost earn like double the amount of the money they get from the floor mat just by uh, uh, weaving these baskets. So, uh, you know, uh, weaving baskets is worth more than weaving a floor mat. So, and the same with the sitting stools and the sitting stools are quite expensive and, and, uh, and the time it takes and the, and, and the value that is in the market uh, of this sitting stool worth more than the floor mat. So that's how we are giving them a, a, a tangible uh, growth for, the, for this community. And here is another one um, that I'm going to um, explain to you. This is about the second approach we take. This is a community that uh, uh, this is most difficult and sensitive work we have done so far uh, with these nomadic people. These people are called routes, and uh, there are only 150 of them. And uh, you know the, their uh, numbers kind of fluctuate and uh, they're very uh, dedicated and devoted to their culture and traditions. And uh, they aren't as flexible as, as other communities like Tari communities that I have shown before. And uh, most of the people, and all these uh, the people here in this community are, are uneducated and uh, you know, they are the nomads. They move from one, uh, one uh, place to another every six, five to six months. And they usually live in the forest and uh, they call us as an outsider and they call themselves as the king of the forest. So this is quite interesting. And this is a very sensitive issue when you're working with. And so this is our second approach. And uh, we as a social entrepreneur, we do not want it to interfere in the culture and tradition. And we approach them, this group of uh, uh, people, royalty people, by appreciating them and their work they have done. And, you know, and, and but for these people, appreciation wasn't just enough for them. 
you know, they wanted uh, to survive because, uh, um, you know, uh, they used to, they make these uh, uh, beautiful wooden crafts like these ones. And, uh, um, you know, they have been making this for generations and uh, uh, they don't sell this uh, in exchange of money. They barter these things with the villagers nearby their camp. So what they do is they cut down the trees and they make this um, beautiful wooden crafts and they go out uh, uh, to the near nearby villagers and try to barter them with like grains and clothing and ornaments. And the, which is kind of like for us, it's, it's more of a, like a historical thing, you know, something that we only see in the movies and, uh, and in the TV series. So this, these people still exist. And, and, and for us and for them, it was more of a survival because lately, the villagers aren't interested to buy these wooden crafts. So, and the, the, uh, they are, uh, they have, uh, the villagers have access to the markets. So they prefer like plastic utensils, metal containers and so on, because they are easy to carry. Uh, they're like, uh, they're very light and they can, you know, and uh, it dries so fast. So they prefer, the villagers prefers um, uh, the current, like, you know, the one in the market, like plastic utensils over this wooden. So they're kind of in a very, uh, um, um, in a dangerous situations and very in a survival mode. So, so we felt like, you know, we, I think it's time to work on these people. And so the, <clears throat> and the interesting thing about these tools is uh, the craft, this, um, the raw made is like, they only use a traditional tool called basula that you're seeing here. It's a very um, a simple tool. There's nothing, uh, uh, you know, nothing fancy to it, but it's quite heavy. And so, and the beautiful, uh, beautiful patterns this uh, this tool makes on this on their craft is like simply uh, amazing you know especially on a, on, a, on a balls and storage chest and to feel that to get the feel of that uh, that tools you need to you know move your hand around those balls you know it's, it's such a, a, a such a beautiful experience that you'll find and also the grains of the uh, the tree and the color of the wood make it more pleasing and uh, so um, this is quite uh, like we've been working with these people for like um, almost like five years now, and uh, but we receive them in a very raw form, you know, something very uh, uh, not ready to go and use it. Uh, so we uh, do some improvisation into it, and uh, but without losing its originality, and uh, so that like when someone buys things, uh, Raute uh, crafts from Kulpa, they can uh, go and readily use it on their home. So this is the. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing, uh, the second approach that we have uh, um, uh, made with uh, a Rauti community, and also like uh, we are connecting with Rauti community through an organization. It's not, we, do, we do not, we are not uh, uh, connecting directly with them. And uh, so, uh, you know, that organization has been working with Rauti for like last 15 years. And, uh, and also the one of the reason why we do not want it to go to the forest and connect with Rauti is we do not want it to interfere and, and bring disturbance to their lifestyle. They are nomads. And we respect that, you know, we respect the lifestyles and, uh, you know, um, and we pay for their crafts through that organizations. And for us, uh, being a social um, enterprise, transparency is very important for us. And so, and uh, until now, we don't have any problem about, um, about it. So everything is going um, quite smoothly. And uh, uh, how we support these Raute uh, people is like by buying their crafts and we also keep some uh, percentage of their uh, uh, sells from their Rauti crafts aside so that that uh, amount of money that we have uh, collected would be used as an emergency fund for them, especially during monsoon time and winter time. Uh, they need some uh, supplies and especially the food and some tents for their camps. So at that moment, you know, we help them with it. And the routers are happy as they feel, uh, I mean, working with us, routers are happy. They feel like the tradition and culture are being supported and also, uh, they are quite uh, being uh, they are being self sustainable. You know, they're, they're, they could sustain themselves. You know, they don't have to ask for help from anyone, even from the like even the government give them some um, some incentives. Now, the last five months, I've heard like uh, routers are haven't uh, doesn't have to go and ask for that incentives as well. You know, the because uh, Kolba has been working with them. So it's, it's, it's quite it's very satisfactory for them. That's what we call as an intangible uh, growth or change that we have been able to bring into the life of Rautes. And, you know, working with all these, they, all these different communities from different regions of Nepal, there always come challenges. You know, we have uh, challenges in, uh, we, we divide the challenges into two forms. One is physical and one is social challenges. Physical in the sense like, you know, most of our materials are raw materials. 
and uh, they grow in the uh, on the community forest and so and uh, uh, they all are natural and when you are working with the natural materials there is always there are so many things that you have to uh, consider like you know uh, um, uh, most of them are like uh, seasonal so you if you have to harvest those uh, materials right in time if you don't it will just uh, be uh, worthless and also like uh, since uh, more ours uh, materials aren't doesn't come from a, a from a from a farm, let's say it's not like you know we go we go and grow these materials. It comes from a community forest, so we don't find them in adequate amount. So when you are building, making our products, and if you have a huge order, we won't be able to supply those because though being natural and 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 comes from far from remote regions and and being uh, uh, not from uh, not in adequate amount, we won't be able to complete that. But that's one of the challenges that we have faced. And there's another one called skills. The people that we work, the communities that we work with are from rural uh, part of Nepal, and most of them has a traditional skills. And actually, you know, working with these traditional skills uh, for people, I think we're kind of supporting them as well as preserving the culture as well. But the thing about this, uh, using these traditional skills is like, not everybody has the very fine skills. So only a few of them have. So especially the elderly ones, elderly like women's, elderly men's have the skills. The new generations uh, or younger people uh, from the same family uh, aren't interested into this. So, you know, they, they think of uh, um, you know, going abroad or like coming to the city and to find a better job. So that's the, another reason that we'll, uh, uh, one another challenge that we're getting. And so, and another is like, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, um, it's a like most of our uh, communities that we work with, most of our partners are from remote regions. And, so, and, and it's quite difficult, especially logistically, when we have to uh, uh, receive some things from, uh, from one part, from that part of uh, uh, Nepal, especially during monsoon and winter time, like it's quite difficult. You know, the Nepal is, uh, is a hilly and it has lots of, um, you know, we, during monsoon time, we get a lot of landslides. The roads are blocked. And so things won't, um, we won't be able to receive um, the goods, um, already made goods uh, from the communities that easily. And and especially and in winter time, uh, uh, from some region like from Tolpa, we won't be able to receive those things because uh, you know uh, during winter time the whole area would be covered in snow, and we have to wait for six months just to receive the goods. And uh, and also um, and the uh, communication things like you know the, not all parts of Nepal has a uh, has a well uh, uh, established communications. Uh, uh, um, um, infrastructure so uh, you know you know place like Jolpa, like you know they all they have a, uh, a mobile phone they have a cell phone but what happens is like the cell phone works only for a few hours of the day uh, you know they have a uh, yeah so so i have to whenever i have to contact these people i have to like you know be very uh, focused and like you know i have to make sure that i call them uh, during those period of time so if not I, i'm gonna miss that so this is another one, and also the um, most of the people that we work with are uh, women's, and uh, you know the women's have a lot of responsibility in the family. Uh, some could be a mother, some could be a grandmother, some could be a daughter, and some, could be, um, you know, the daughter-in-laws, and so they have their own their own family obligation. They can't uh, uh, make things um, um, just like you know going to office and do like nine to five kind of work. You know, they have to finish their household work, finish their jobs with the kids and everything. And then, you know, whenever they have a free time, they'll do things, uh, they will make things for us. So there's uh, family and social obligations as well. And uh, most of our, um, you know, uh, the partners or the makers are not well educated, you know, because the, they have to, uh, they haven't gone to school. Uh, most of them haven't gone to school, but they have learned to make things. Uh, from the mother or from the grandmother or from the grandparents. Or from the parents. So, and uh, for them, the education hasn't been much uh, uh, of the, uh, when growing up, the education hasn't been much of importance. For them, it's, uh, for them, it was more about uh, like to get, uh, you know, the food every day. So, you know, they are more about like what to eat for next day. So, but these people have a beautiful skills and, uh, you know, I really wanted to, to, to work with them and uh, don't want it to make them feel like you know, they are uh, they're on the, they're on worth not uh, much as other educated people. They have skills. Skills is something that you that you um, you know you gain only by practicing or 
doing more. So it's just like going to school. So, but uh, especially when, when communicating with these people, it's a bit difficult, uh, but you know, so far, um, uh, not bad, but this is one of our challenges. <laughs> so, and uh, so, you know, um, from the very first day, our objective um, was to create a, an environment and lifestyle where human and nature coexist and be supportive of each other. Uh, that's the motto of Kolpa. Like we have always been like this from the very first day, and we wanted to. And but you know, uh, in this process, we wanted to make sure that that, that you know the we follow the ethical, social, and cult cultural issues. You know, we should address all these things. We should keep their, those in mind in each and every step. You know, we we show respect to makers and the culture, and we also make sure that environment isn't harmed in any way. You know, we wanted to uh, um, we wanted to leave this uh, earth for next generations. So it is not only about designing product for the market. Uh, what we believe is like you know, Kulpa is also designing uh, uh, for the positive uh, social change for the society. So uh, uh, you know, uh, in no matter what we do, but we always think about the uh, uh, that aspect, the social aspect of um, of our product and our customers. So, and um, yeah, um, uh, you can reach us uh, through a lot of social uh, uh, social media channels. We have a Facebook page, uh, Instagram page, Twitter, and we also have our own website, uh, coldpower.com, which is kind of like, for now, it's uh, it's on hold, uh, but you can access to it, you can order it. And we also have a store in Kathmandu where you can get in, where you can come and feel the product that we, uh, uh, make and we design and we sell here in Nepal. Yeah, so that's all about it. Thank you so much, everyone, for for being here and and and, and sharing and being you know being here. Thank you so much, Ravi and Kalpa World, for sharing your wonderful work and your approach working with both indigenous and nomadic communities and supporting local craft. Uh, with that, I would like to thank both Compartment Espo and Kolpa World for their fantastic presentations. We will open this session now for conversation. We invite the audience to share your questions for the presenters. Uh, please type your questions. I would like to introduce and welcome our moderators for the conversation today. Our moderators today are architects Tejaswini Krishna from Bangalore, India who is currently a student of the Base Habitat program in Austria. So she joins us from Austria today. Our second moderator for the day is architect Kavindu Deserum from Sri Lanka, who's pursuing his master's in architecture at the University of Liverpool and joins us from the UK today. Please type in audience questions and we look forward to this wonderful conversation and dialogue with Kolpa, Compartment S4 and our two moderators. Thank you. Hi, um, I would like to congratulate both the studios for creating uh, uh, something meaningful and beautiful <laughs> that is sustainable in every sense of economical, environmental and social aspects. Um, and uh, addressing to Kolpa, uh, if you, you just mentioned that uh, you read out your motto about how uh, your commitment is to discover and market the traditional ingenuity and uh, how you've invo involved the community uh, through participatory approach to create designs and your products. So we would uh, like to know about uh, your initial barriers that you faced while uh, you were uh, starting off with the communities and um, uh, what is the change that the communities feel uh, uh, since you mentioned it's been five years that uh, the collaboration has been happening? Could you uh, please elaborate on this, Mr. Rabi? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Yeah, you know, um, we have work um, with communities from different regions of Nepal and, uh, and uh, every uh, region has their own challenges to working with. And some are quite accessible, and some are not. And uh, you know, and uh, the one, the common thing that I found, especially in the beginning of um, um, when I'm approaching those communities, was about the trust. You know, because uh, 
because I'm I think uh, for them it was uh, it was just not only me they have been approached by so many other uh, uh, business people as well I guess but uh, they haven't um, uh, you know the only thing uh, I miss uh, lacking uh, uh, when I compare myself with other was like you know I saw some respect and I appreciate the craft you know because uh, uh, um, that's what they need because uh, you know most of the uh, uh, communities that we work with most of the makers that we have are not well educated you know how you know and uh, you know as you know like you know how you would when you go and approach these people uh these uh, makers like you know first you have to show some respect to them personally and and to their crafts that are on you know and uh and so and it was a trust was a huge issue in the beginning but um as we um move along um, uh, i think uh, we have again um, it, it has come up to a relationship now. You know, it's more about not only about the business; it's just more about the relationship now. Like some are, some talk to me like as if like I'm their brother. Some talk to me like, you know, like uh, um, yeah, not as a friend. So, so the business has completely uh, been uh, kind of slowly dissolving here now. We are more into relationship. So that's how I trust has a big issue for me now, which is uh, again. And another part, uh, another question is uh, about what has been what changes had been made, especially with the, uh, the one I talked about, the uh, Taru community from the Southern Nepal was like, um, you know, uh, I still remember, let me just give you one example of one, uh, one person from that community telling me about uh, 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 the changes that he had seen. Uh, that was like almost like a, a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I just came to know about this community and we started working and then on the first they were just making a floor mat and then now they're making all these different uh, home goods and personal accessories and, and the kitchen items. And the guy uh, was supposed to bring me some uh, um, uh, goods from there because, you know, we still use the passenger bus to transport our products from that part. And then when I went there to pick, pick that thing up and you know what he said to me, uh, you know, Ravi Ji, uh, uh, you know, I'm so happy that uh, uh, you are involved with this, uh, with, with my community there. Because, uh, um, um, you know, I have seen them. I have seen women there, one who doesn't have a slippers to wear and one who can't even buy uh, uh, the bangles or a makeup kits for themselves, even during the festivals. Now are wearing a, a, a nice shoes and like, you know, are, have a, uh, uh, now they don't have to ask for uh, money from their parents or, or from their in-laws just to buy things for themselves. So, you know, that is quite content for me. I mean, that makes me, more happy than you know than anything else. So those changes that I uh, brought, especially uh, for themselves to be self-sustained and like you know self-independency, that is the more that I think that is the thing that I have gained for them. And with the Raute, like you know, with the, with that community, uh, uh, Raute uh, used to get like two thousand rupees every month from the government. Uh, so for last five months, in last five months, they haven't gotten any from the government because you know, all these things is happening. And the, the Raute are the least, uh, uh, are the least uh, are considerate, considerably. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, they are the least group of people that the government will worry about. That the last thing, and for the last five months, you know, they haven't, they, they didn't even worry about the government incentives because you know, because we are working with them. We have been working with them and they're kind of like self, I mean, you know, self-dependent, I guess. Yeah. So that makes me happy. That is the changes that I think I have been, I think, and I hope that, you know, that change will be continued in future as well. That was quite inspiring. And um, now, uh, would uh, Compartment S4 uh, like to build upon this? As you were mentioning, uh, um, a lot of social projects that you guys have worked on and uh, how you uh, involved the communities throughout the process from uh, till the documentation stage and having exhibitions later on. Um, so how was your initial uh, uh, communication with these people and how did it uh, how did the participatory approach in the initial days was like or uh, the challenges that you would like to so uh, yeah i mean for us it was um, participatory approaches started off uh, we started off by just entering the entering a number of um, 
geographical regions to understand how we can find our way into it. Uh, so when uh, if I were to just talk about Uttarakhand, uh, it started with an approach to bring about uh, changes in their building techniques, which can be taken forward because we had seen a rampant use of materials like concrete and steel in a place like Uttarakhand, <clears throat> uh, which is not climate, which requires a climate sensitive approach. So it started from there, but now today uh, it has expanded and uh, right from building with local materials uh, to bringing in some amount of earthquake resilience in the structural system. We're now looking at a, a larger uh, participatory approach where we're trying to uh, develop certain amount of livelihood generation by working with the community. So the last project that we showed uh, was an initiative towards that. I mean, it was a step towards that initiative where uh, we are we were trying to empower the community to tourism um, as a means. So. Um, so it's it has uh, it's now bifurcated into even um, working with. So we recognized within the community we recognized these small scale uh, horticulture that is taking place, like for example, haldi manufacture or um, mushroom plantations, and uh, knowing that the agriculture in the region is dying down, we're finding ways that we can uh, plug into the community and enhance that. I think Monique can uh, unmute and talk a little more in detail about um, the livelihood generation there. So basically, whenever we work in rural areas, it is very specific that we need to involve the locals in anything that we are doing because whenever you are going there, you are the visitors. So you cannot impose anything, but you have to merge your design, merge yourself within the context and come up with something which is meaningful for them. Only then it is going to be sustainable and more beneficial. So through this initiative called BASA, there were multiple layers of livelihood generation that we did initially. The first thing was the a group of 10 women actually came together to form a self-help group, which were the ones running this place called BASA. Apart from that, it also promoted a lo uh, lot of local handicrafts like Aldi, mushrooms, mandvika, atta. There are a lot of medicinal plants and there are a lot of ghee and all those dairy products. So this is a place from where all these products can be sold as well as it can be collected. So it works as a collection center as well as the tourists coming can come and buy these products. And also we generated, like we generated discussions among the locals to, uh, to educate people in terms of trekking guides, tourist guides, how they can show their agriculture, how they can show the village producers around so if any tourist is there, they can they can have a proper trekking uh, trekking tour with the local trekking guide of the biodiversity of the local agriculture. So that is how all the people came in together. So the direct employment was only for the ten women, but apart from that, these secondary livelihood opportunities actually helped a lot to get the village together through this initiative. Okay. So uh, generating the economy of the place by recognizing the skills and uh, uh, the local resources and uh, the people is a very important aspect, as uh, you mentioned. So, um, so while creating this, uh, generating the local economy of a particular community and region. So uh, if we were to say, uh, what is the roadmap that you guys are looking at uh, for upscaling this whole idea? probably uh, in terms of policy making or <clears throat> any other measures that uh, you guys are taking. Can you please elaborate on that? Uh, yeah. I would like that. So basically, we've been working in this area uh, in Uttarakhand since two years and uh, slowly, slowly we are building up our, our status there and we are through projects. So as BASA is one initiative that we have started, we would like to have such initiatives come further. Like uh, it's not just tourism, it's like the whole community uh, has to come forward and the place has to uh, come up. So the econom economic generation is very important for the villagers who are staying there. So through smaller initiatives, like not just uh, tourism, maybe horticulture or uh, 
like uh, electricity generation like solar power everything it's so basically like uh, like taking up the whole village it's like a model village sort of a, a thing that is what we are aiming for for our next projects or that is what we want to do monik would you like to elaborate more on this and also actually through this one village the idea was that by doing this basa we not only magnified the khirsu village but also the entire surroundings around khirsu so so now khir basa as an initiative has been become famous throughout uttarakhand so like most of the villages know about how this initiative was taken forward so the villagers themselves are willing to like have such ideas being implemented within their village and also the government has now started to respond to us so we think that with an increased government support we can actually execute more villages uh, not as a similar like a tourism model but everyone can have whatever they are best at as you told that whatever the existing skills are we are trying to just build up on that in whatever village we are able to work with and that is similar for gujarat or uttarakhand okay that's uh, very interesting to know and also uh, we would uh, like to know more about uh, the upscaling ideas that uh, um, kolpa um, mr rabi would have for kolpa could you please elaborate on that yeah uh, about this upscaling thing because uh, you know our product has always been very exclusive and uh, most of them especially um, you know the skills that we are using are all traditional ones and uh and that doesn't involve any more equipments and uh most of our uh most of the places that these things are made uh are in a very rural region and uh and also the materials are uh, have the like if you know as i mentioned before it has a very natural aspect to it so it need to be harvested in a in a in a, in a certain certain time of the year so uh for scaling things up you know you need to have a storage like you know that so that the raw materials can be found uh, uh um uh 365 days a year so uh because of this uh, um uh, limitations um uh, you know we need to rethink our plan on on, on going to the mass so uh, uh for us it's a, it's a quite difficult um at the moment uh, um you know for, to uh, to get the skills in in, in masses is, isn't that a it be a big problem cuz uh, you know uh, if we have a, a if we set up a workshop if we set up a training and you know in a few months if we have the people interested in if we bring the interested people into it we can do that but especially with the natural with, with the raw materials we are we are very kind of limited and, uh, and uh, um you know it's it's a hard to to scale up our things and about like the policy thing i think the government has to understand this as uh, even now like when you have to go and harvest the raw materials from community forest the government will only um, uh, only allow like certain amount of uh, certain um amount of material per person so and um you know um and uh, not every year like you know the um every person will get enough um uh, of those materials uh to make things you know the most of the things will just uh uh be left over in the in, in the in the forest and and get composted so in that part hopefully our government will understand but until now so we don't have anything you know from the government side yet uh, yeah okay i uh, i'd like to thank again for both the studios for their wonderful presentations um something i was interested in is so while um considering the local um the current global trends everything big everything's becoming mass produced and our um you know factory made and the stuff that you guys are doing by using the local methods and um, interacting with the communities help tackle that so i was interested in asking while working with the local communities who are familiar with these vernacular principles and um local methods how did you bridge that gap between uh, using the traditional methods or uh, materials in order to meet the um, modern day problems i don't know if you could also give uh, maybe like give an example of uh, one of your products or projects as well exactly let me just go with that first um um uh, you know i just mentioned to you, um about the thari community that we were working with in the southern part of nepal and they have been making uh the floor mats for themselves 
and their and their families uh, for a, quite a long time. They have been using the locally available raw materials and their local traditional skills. And when we found out that that the materials has a, such a uh, has a beautiful aesthetic value to it, uh, we we realized that you know it has we have to um, um, we have to explore that material a bit. So what we did was uh, um, uh, we designed uh, some of the things that can be done using that materials, and we approach that community, and then um, um, you know. So that community, instead of just making a floor mats, now you know they have started making like sitting stools, and uh, uh, they have even started making uh, uh, a futon out of it, and a storage box, and uh, lamp sets, and uh, a nice baskets, storage baskets that are quite in demand um, in the in, in the Western world. So, and uh, you know, for them at first, it is quite new to them, and uh, they you know they're kind of hesitated to to do those things. But you know, you you work with them, you talk to them, you know, uh, you know, you share ideas with them, you give you 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 encourage them to do it, you know. So uh, so that way, uh, uh, finally, um, our finished product came out, and uh, yeah, everybody appreciate it. Uh, everybody likes it. Yeah, that's how we do our you know uh, bring those traditional skills and materials into the to modern households. That's how, that's how I do. It. That's that's just that's one of the examples from Taru community. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. Um, studio um, compartment S4, uh, would yeah, you like would, to elaborate as well? Yeah. So basically, I'll answer this in terms of architecture, how this mix of vernacular and contemporary has come into our practice. So whenever we go into the rural, we have noticed that the, the older houses are now being left empty and they are now shifting to the RCC houses. So we just try to dig in a bit deep as to what are the defaults or what are the things which they are not liking about the older houses, whereas certain problems like the roof leakages, no more the thin slate stones are being made for the roof. So that is why they have to shift to a tin roof. So there are these certain problems and also, also due to a major migration of uh, younger generation from the Uttarakhand mountains to the plains. The skills which were there earlier, like the wooden carpentry skills, the stone masonry skills, like they no more exist. Like you can find 20% or 30% of the earlier people who used to work, they work right now. And there are a lot of laborers and mysteries who come from Nepal who are migrated to Uttarakhand. So that is how it has been working right now. So we have to find these uh, quick solutions on site so that so that we can teach the new people also how to do it. At the same time, there can be smaller solutions. So like if I give you an example, so in the wooden joints, all the wooden joints that you see in the earlier buildings, they were literally the wooden logs, which are not finished. But now you cannot source such wooden logs because of the forest restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. So now you can get the cut sections, whichever size you want. And by just uh, providing certain steel joineries at certain places, it it simplifies the wooden junctions a lot. So your wooden carpentry skills reduce considerably just by introducing certain steel joints. Similarly, in mud plaster, we were exploring as to what oil binding materials we can give so that the mud plaster sticks a bit longer. Binding materials like lime, white cement, or normal cement, what proportions we can add them to just give them a longer, longer lasting solution so that they don't shift to a concrete plaster, which they are doing right now. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kishan. Um, I'm just going to jump into some questions from the audience now. Uh, so this is from um, Devi Nair. She says, uh, hello, there seems to be a lot of commonalities between the two studios. Both works are immensely valuable. My question is to both studios. Could you please tell us how easy or difficult it is to pitch your ideas to the local authorities or communities? Okay, uh, let me just uh, um, um, answer that questions from my perspective, from the works I have done. And yeah, at first it was, uh, um, you know, nobody wants to change. I mean, like, you know, when you have a, such a comfortable life, you just, you know, go along with the time and, 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 and everyday life. And uh, when, I, when we approached uh, to a community uh, with the new ideas, like at first, like, and they will always say like we haven't done it before you know it's it, we haven't seen this before i don't think we really, you know it can be done but uh, um you know you sit sit with them you you as i told you before the building trust was the uh, the biggest hurdle that that have i uh, that i have found so and the once that trust is gained and the ones you have a kind of relationship kind of thing 
you know, uh, they don't mind uh, trying the new things as well. So, uh, but, you know, but only thing is like, you know, when you're developing a prototype, when you pitch a new ideas and, and, and bring that to a table and ask them, you know, uh, and work with them and, and, and make it, you know, at first it always comes out not the way you expect it. But the thing is like, you know, you have to appreciate their work. That's the first thing that you have to do. You don't say like, you know, you're, you have to give them a constructive criticism and you have to be positive about, it, about their work. And then, you know, but, but and uh, just because they made it not the way you are, you are you're expecting, I mean, uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, they shouldn't get paid. You have to pay them in a full amount. So, you know, uh, so you have to make sure like, you know, they get the value of it in both ways, you know, to the payment method as well as of the uh, respect of their time. So if you did that, things will come out perfectly. Yeah, that's what I did. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ravi. Um, compartment S4, would you like to elaborate on that as well? Um, yeah, I guess for us, uh, we it, uh, it starts by by observation. So we we kind of enter the site by just observing. Uh, the context and uh, how what would our role be um, and then then there's there are two ways uh, two sets of people who we uh, approach one is the local body which is generally the sarpanch or uh, some government body which is handling the region and the other is uh, the key representative of uh, certain groups of people in the village or uh, just just their um, the large congregations that happen at night, just sitting uh, with them at social spots. So that's when, that's how we start to understand the community and also the way the funding and things like that work because both uh, our proposals in terms of participatory design as well as making it happen have to, in terms of funding, have to move in tandem. So um, so that's how the, uh, the approach of uh, developing a program with the people and uh, fitting it into certain kind of funding which the government is providing works. Um, but in terms of uh, understanding uh, the gaps that exist, uh, it it comes. Um, I mean, there is, there is also a set. Uh, there is also the locals, uh, the local labor that we have to, or the masons that uh, play a key role when we're working. Um, so like Monique already said, there's uh, there's certain amount of training workshops that we have to do before even executing the pro project. So in Vasa, we had to do certain amount of mud plaster um, or um, uh, or uh, sourcing out how, how are we going to get carpenters. Uh, so these are the different levels of... Monique, do you want to elaborate? Uh, <clears throat> can I? Can you just repeat me the question once? Um, yeah. So the uh, question was. Um, it is so there's a lot. Rude. Yeah, you can. Yeah, there's a lot of commonalities between both the studios. And um, can you please tell us how easy or difficult it was to pitch your ideas to the local authorities and communities? Actually, it depends on so the sarpanches or the I think the bureaucrats are a better option to go to rather than the local politicians because bureaucrats always have a vision to actually execute something or do something. At the same time, you need certain uh, force driven by the local gram panchayat or the local governing bodies, which are the main people who. So basically, they will be the link between us and the local villagers because that is the entry point through which we enter the villages. That is how we get familiar to the villages because in any of the project we have spent at least like three, four weeks by just going to the villages and knowing the villages before actually uh, pitching anything as an idea to them. And as Mr. Rabi said, that trust building is the most important part. And that too, when we come from the cities to the villages, they always think that we have an ulterior motive behind whatever we are doing. So they are a bit skeptical at the first. So it is very important to convince them as to what we are giving is going to benefit them more than us or something like that. That is when that trust building happens and that is when we can take the project forward from there. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we've got uh, today for the questions. And I'd like to thank once again for both um, studios, Culper World and um, Commandments for, for their wonderful talks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, presenters, moderators, audience, Clayworks, DU team for your time and inspired feedback. Uh, Priyanka from Design United will be sharing our upcoming events. Please join us next week as well. Sure. Yeah. I am thank Priyanka Shirke, an intern with VSLA. I would like to thank Compartment S4 and Kolpa World for their wonderful presentation and to our moderators for an interesting conversation. I hope everyone will follow Compartment S4 and Kolpa World on social media to stay updated about their interesting work. So far, Design has organized five installments of Design Conversation, and we have many more exciting conversations lined up with designers across the spectrum joining us to share their thoughts. Next week, we have Conchita Blanco and Avalon Carpenter of Blanco Studio and Kalpataru joining us from Bali, and Avinash Ankalge joining us from India. So I hope everyone would join us next Friday as well. Further, I would like to say that Design United as a platform is a collaborative space and we encourage everybody who wants to collaborate with us or volunteer to help us to follow us and DM us on Instagram. We are excited to hear from you. Thank you.